<laughs> Brian, just know we can hear you, okay? We're going live. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Co-Centenium for Transformation Google Hangout on Air. Today's Hangout is focused on how stakeholders are moving forward with their digital conversion uh, that might be in the form of a BYOD or a one-to-one. -one. I'm Ann Weir. I'm a co facilitator for Teaming for Transformation, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Teaming for Transformation 2 supports COSIN's commitment to innovation and education and also their commitment to effective use of communities of practice. Uh, they see this as a key way to, uh, for con uh, educators to connect with one another. We are grateful for the sponsorship of Follett, Pearson, and Presidio. COSIN Teaming for Transformation um, is made up of district leadership teams across uh, 20, at least 20 districts across our nation. We have about 139 district and school leaders who are committed to planning for or maybe enhancing the digital conversion for their students, their teachers, their leaders, and their communities. And each of these uh, leaders are participating in an online community of practice. Today we have two districts uh, that have graciously agreed to share with us um, their insights on um, from those people that are where, the, where we say where the rubber meets the road, where teachers and um, instructional technology coaches and principals and assistant principals are working with students in a student-centered environment. Each of the districts that we have with us today, being Forsyth County Schools in Georgia and Forest Grove in Oregon, are very well known and respected for their, for their leadership in using technology to enable successful uh, learning environments. Let me come back to the camera. There we go. Okay. Um, today we uh, encourage you to post, uh, if you have questions for Forsyth or you have questions for um, Forest Grove, we encourage you to post your comments there in the chat window in YouTube and we'll transfer that, those back to them so that you can hear their responses. Um, but before we uh, get further into this discussion today, let's learn a little bit about these district leaders and um, who they have with them today and these school leaders and who they have with them today. So we'll start with Forsyth. Uh, Debbie, I'll ask that you start if you'd let us know a little bit about Forsyth County Schools and uh, who's with you today. Okay. Um, I'm Debbie Smith. I'm principal here at Cole Mountain Elementary School in Forsyth County. Forsyth County is located about 30 miles north of Atlanta. Um, it was once a small town that has grown into a bedroom community mm -hmm. of Atlanta. Um, and we have been in a um, phase of uh, just unprecedented growth. We have been a district that at one time was leading the nation in growth. We, I think we are now third or fourth. Um, we've had, we have a great change in our demographics, um, have had over the past several years, um, and we continue to grow at a very high rate. Um, so that's just kind of who we are as a district. We have a very um, progressive school district mm -hmm. um, and very much um, a great vision of our Board of Education and our superintendent in their strategic plan of what they want in the next five to ten years. Um, that, that vision, beginning back in the early 1990s, actually has laid the groundwork to build the capacity needed for the technological advances we've been able to make. And it has taken a period of years to build that capacity. So um, kudos to, to our district for having that, that vision um, years and years ago. Um, so with me today, um, I will introduce to my right in red, um, this is Kelly Moore. Kelly is our instructional technology specialist um, in Forsyth County, every school is allotted one instructional technology specialist to support instruction with the use of technology. On my left, right here in white, is Tracy Abercrombie. Tracy is a fifth grade teacher, and Tracy has been the absolute leader in BYOT implementation. She blazed the trail for all of the other teachers in the school and has quite, quite a story to share with you. And then to my far left, is our assistant principal, Kim Fox. 
And Ms. Fox really is the guru behind our professional learning uh, and what it has taken to build a team here that um, really supports each other in, in this initiative. So that's kind of an overview. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, we'll now move to Forest Grove, Oregon, and the, uh, their team will introduce who is with them today. Forest Grove? Hi there, my name is Brandon Hundley, and I'm the principal of Neil Armstrong Middle School in Forest Grove. <clears throat> to my right is uh, Marshall Cook, a seventh grade science teacher, and to my left, Nicole Carter, an eighth grade social, or excuse me, language arts teacher and tech coach. And uh, we have a, a pretty large district um, in the area. We have 6,500 or 5,600 students. We're at about 65% free and reduced lunch. We have a large portion of Latino students as well. We're actually a minority majority uh, school district. And we have about 22% of our students that are English language learners. Um, we also have a very strong uh, leadership team at the district office and school board who also have a very uh, complete and full of vision um, plan for us in terms of action plan for us for the next five years. And part of that has been really increasing the um, accessibility for students in the district to technology and really beginning here at Neil Armstrong with our one-to-one -one program. I feel very lucky to have not only these two teachers with me, but a, a staff of teachers who are very, very willing to try new things and experiment. Um, Nicole, the language arts teacher, has really been very much a heart, uh, uh, at the heart of our planning around the one-to-one -one model for Neil Armstrong. She's worked with iPads in her classroom for the past three years, mm -hmm. um, this year being our first to go to a one-to-one. -one. Marshall is a very strong teacher overall and has really done a great job of the technology into his building, so or into his classroom. So we feel really strong about where we are in our first five months of a one-to-one -one, uh, model and, and kind of where we're headed. We're starting to gather results now that show we're having a pretty big impact on engagement and um, attendance and certainly on behavior. So we're looking forward to seeing our end-of-year results and kind of see, be able to track and how well we're doing in our first couple of years. Thank you, Brandon, and to your team there um, at Forest Grove School District. Um, let's look really quickly at the types of um, things that these folks will be sharing with us today. I'm going to share my screen out here real quick. There we go. Um, so today we'll um, ask that they share with us, uh, have there been some, some big ahas since your school initiated uh, as Forsyth has indicated their BYOD or as Forest Grove has reflected on their one-to-one -one. as you've gone through this changing to a student-centered learning environment. Some big things that you've learned. Uh, and what does professional learning look like? Uh, we already heard Debbie uh, talk a little bit about that as you're using these devices with kids in classrooms. Uh, next, um, how did you go about building a coalition, uh, building a focus group with stakeholders uh, to move towards this digital conversion, whether it be with parents or students or, or teachers. Um, next, um, how has have you seen uh, that teach and learning may be transitioning? And what are some examples um, that Brandon's already referenced about students being more engaged in their classrooms? And last, uh, which Brandon also uh, mentioned, what are, are there some metrics that have influenced the monitoring of the progress of your digital conversion? So those are the kind of things that we would want to learn more about you today, and I'll turn it back over to Debbie and Forsyth. Okay, um, I'll just share with you our journey here at Cole Mountain that began about three years ago. Um, typically in the district beforehand, it had been um, bring your own technology, but starting at the uh, uh, high school level. And um, one of the things that we felt very strongly about is we knew looking at our even our preschool children they truly are the digital natives they they were coming to us they were they were our teachers um, they were teaching the teachers about technology and we felt like it was our um, moral purpose for lack of a better word that we teach them the importance of becoming a digital native and Kelly might just want to share what she does here that because that really is a, a baseline piece okay um, my role, again, is an instructional technology specialist, so I um, work to support the teachers and kind of provide the scaffolding to, you know, work with them in their classroom to give them ideas, to give them, you know, software help, 
um, to go come in and co-teach lessons. I do kind of a variety of different things every day. I'm, I'm learning every day what my job is. Um, but I get to do a lot of really fun stuff because I get to come in and um, the teachers are excited because, you know, they're getting support. The kids are excited because they're getting to do something engaging. So that's kind of my main purpose is to get in and make sure that, you know, the students are um, being given that opportunity to learn in a little bit more rigorous, a little bit more engaging environment. But quite honestly, we learn a lot of... Um, a lot of software information, a lot of app information from the students. I mean, we, we get a lot of um, information from them. They're coming in, and, and of course we're elementary, so we're in a little bit different place um, because our students are so excited to learn and so excited to kind of use what they have. Um, mm -hmm. and we're BYOT, so they're bringing in all sorts of different devices, um, and we're trying to support them kind of with learning how to use them for an educational purpose. And being appropriate use. Absolutely. Um, and, and the importance of, of the digital footprint and how that stays with you for the rest of your life. Um, getting that across to them at a very young age, instilling those values, mm -hmm. I think, is very important before they get to the middle school level. Um, so we actually roll this out, thinking we would roll out BYOT school-wide. <laughs> well, <laughs> we found out quite quickly that that was not going to be the way to go. And part of that is the fear that the teachers had of every student bringing to class mm -hmm. their own device. What does that look like? How do you manage that in your classroom? The second thing that was a very big hurdle, we have found that we need to educate our parents. They, they know what the devices look like from what they hear on the news media, from texting, from pictures, from all mm -hmm. the fearful things. They don't understand how powerful of a tool it is in engaging students in their learning and the educational um, applications. aspects or applications of it. So um, one of the things that we've had to do is, is revamp how we train our, t our parents. So we've implemented a, a academy night a couple of times a year where parents actually come and their students walk them through the process of how they use their um, devices. And I remember last year it was just so funny that parents didn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> we had to help them out the building because they were like so excited about what their kids were doing and how engaged they were in it. So it really is a process of training parents um, and of allowing what really has caught on. And Tracy, I have to give her all the credit for this, and Kelly too. When teachers began to see the success that Tracy was having in her classroom, with classroom engagement, with the excitement that the children were expressing in their learning, it caught on like wildfire. So instead of, as the principal, me saying, every classroom is going to be BYOT, just from watching what was happening, it grew immensely. We started with two classrooms at the end of the year. By the end of the first year, we had 18 classrooms on board oh fully. Yeah. And now we are pretty much 100% BYOT um, in all classrooms. So. When we talk about the big ahas, um, we'll all share some of those, but I think the biggest aha for me as a building level leader is the importance up front of building those trusting relationships mm -hmm. with uh, teachers, with parents, teachers with parents. That really has been the key, is that the, the teacher-parent relationship, because if those parents trust that teacher, it's going to be a much easier road than if, if they don't. Um, the other big aha was, you know, you hear technology is a great thing, and it is an engaging thing, but it is a tool. It is simply a tool. It does not take the place of a sound lesson design that's rigorous. If you don't have good instructional uh, lessons or good instructional practices, the technology is not going to be successful. So that's been a big aha. And I'm going to let um, Tracy and Kelly share some of their ahas also and professional learning. So. Um, well, you know, I teach fifth grade, and um, like they were sharing, there was a time where our administration said, hey, we're going to um, look at using BYOT in the classroom. And I'll be honest with you, I've been teaching now 20 years. Um, that day, I decided maybe I need to look into a different job and find something else. It was it was that terrifying for me. I'm, I'm not a lover of technology, or I wasn't then. I am now. Um, I've grown in the last couple of years, and technology has honestly transitioned my love and my passion for my job. 
it's wow. been that huge for me. Um, so the day that I was very fearful, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to attack this. I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to figure it out, and I'm going to jump on the bandwagon. And there, my own children shared with me some things on their um, iPhones that they could do, and so I thought. I'm going to try this. So I went into my classroom, and at the very beginning for me, it was really about technology. Um, it was about learning to use the technology. That's how it started for me. And when I saw some of the things that my computer could do with their devices, I was floored. I was floored the day that I learned that my computer could connect to all their devices, and their 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 devices could show what was on my screen. Mm -hmm. That was. I ran to probably five <laughs> different teachers, and I said, you've got to see this. So that was where the journey for me started, and um, one of my biggest ahas through the course of that year was, uh-oh, my classroom management had to change, because now everybody is connecting digitally. So much had to change. It wasn't just paper, pencil anymore, and now there was a danger of, you know, them getting online, them searching things that they shouldn't be searching. And so I had to stop dead in my tracks. And um, we had to, you know, reestablish the management of the classroom, the rules, the trust was huge. Um, we had professional learning. Um, our instructional technology teacher is incredible, reminding us constantly. She would come into my classroom, remind them about digital footprints. And so that was huge for us when their technology uh, messed up. You know, what do they do? Did they just scream out in the classroom and tell me that they had technology trouble? No. We have, you know, we're going to have procedures that when your technology messes up, we're going to, you know, share, we're going to collaborate with someone else. So those were some of the, the, big thing, the big things in my journey at the beginning. Now, what are we, a couple years into it? Um, and I was just saying, I think for me now the biggest thing has changed. It's not really about the technology anymore. That's sort of... Um, you know, that's the fun. It's not about the technology. Now it's about what can I do with it. It's about can I teach them to, um, you know, ask better questions. Can I teach them to, um, you know, ask their questions and go find the answers to their question. Mm -hmm. I'm not the expert in the classroom anymore. Can I teach them how to text to the board and then monitor your, what you're saying and what you've typed and then look at what your peers are saying and look at what they've said and then can you make your you know, can you answer a little more specifically? Um, you know, so they've learned, I think it's allowed them to connect to each other and it's allowed them to learn um, from each other. Um, it's allowed, yeah, sorry. No, 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 uh, I just want to jump in really quickly because um, I'm so excited about hearing what you're saying. Um, we all know, and I'm going back to Debbie mentioning around sound instructional practices and that technology may enable some of those even further. But if we know what sound instructional practices are, that is the, the foundation from which we work. I see Debbie shaking her head. So um, just listening, you talk about what's going on in your classroom. I'm reminded of the, of the significance of feedback. And what I'm hearing that's going on in your classroom is there's, there's this feedback loop that's constantly yeah. taking place on a very, very regular basis yes. uh, with your kids. And Debbie, and you probably know this too, can tell you that's a very sound instructional practice. Yeah, congrats. That's so, 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 so exciting. But go ahead. I've interrupted you. Well, let me tell you one little story. Um, the year that this started, and I still was really sort of um, juggling the idea of doing this. I wasn't completely sold. I had um, a group of special ed students. Um, and as you know, you have kids in your class like me, that talk too much and they're always raising their <laughs> hand and you hear from the same students over and over and over. But when we started texting to the board and seeing each other's responses, mm -hmm. I, I, I started to cry one day because I had a little boy who never ever raised his hand. Oh. He couldn't get his thoughts out and he stuttered and he, he couldn't, sure. he would never raise his hand, to, but he was very, very, very brilliant. And when he would text to the board, the kids were like, really? He said that? And so it was amazing to me that that gave him a voice. Yeah. You know, for the first time, this little boy had a voice 
and it didn't have to be one that we could hear auditorily. It was it was the written word, and everybody else could then read what he had to say. And all of a sudden, he he had a place in our classroom just the same way everybody. He wasn't different in that in that you know sense. So that was a um, that was one of the biggest wow. things that that got me sold on the technology. Very powerful. Yeah, I want to add another big aha because you reminded me of um, one of the things we were. Um, a little concerned about was the BYOT bringing in your own technology what about those students um, free and reduced lunch that might not have access to technology mm -hmm. to bring to school so we were concerned about mm -hmm. that and um, it was a, it was wonderful what happened and what what occurred was that they began to share the students that had technology mm -hmm. would share with the others we do still have uh, four computers in the classroom. We have access to laptops um, that the district has provided and prepared, like the vision that Debbie was talking about earlier. But even that, they they like their own devices. And and Kelly mentioned that they have different devices. So one of the things that was discovered was that um, maybe I have the uh, Kindle Fire, but Tracy had a had an iPhone. Well, I can do things on my Fire, then she could do things. So then mm -hmm. the collaboration began, mm -hmm. and the sharing of technology, and it was really it was wonderful the way the students became a team and shared. But also, I think I have to, and Debbie and I've talked about this a lot just going into Tracy's classroom and all of the classrooms kindergarten through fifth grade where they've had all this technology support in, in the BYOT the engagement level of the students <laughs> is skyrocketed it's um, every child is engaged in in the and very active in their learning and it also helps with that differentiation piece mm -hmm. as well so it's been good but I do have to say kudos to our Kelly Moore our ITS because she has been instrumental. Not only has the county supported us with their vision and provided the, the tools for us to get started, but she has instructed the teachers with how to use the technology, and she's there at a moment's call for the kids and for the teachers. And I think that's huge in, in the way we've been successful. The teachers, like Tracy, who goes in there with that sound instruction, it just she knows that with her sound instruction, if she hits a glitch, she's got Kelly to, to fall back on. That's true. And, and another thing, too, is um, this is huge. When you have an administration that really supports you honestly, and I've heard them talk about you know some of the teachers that aren't using it, and there is absolutely no judgment, um, and, and there's no fear in this building. And I think that that is when, you, when there's no fear and there's no risk, and you can just jump in if you feel ready, and if you're not ready, there's support for you, mm -hmm. but there's no judgment. There, that's a that is a beautiful thing, and I think it just allows optimal growth in your building. And and honestly, that's we've got that here. Well, it sounds like um, that there has been, as Debbie alluded to, that was very important, a lot of trust building and relationship building, uh, not only between administration and with teachers, but working with parents. Um, also and working with with kids um, if you could speak a little bit and you mentioned this just a second ago um, Debbie when you were talking a little bit about um, how you've kind of been taking the temperature along the way H how are we doing and where do we need to maybe make some adjustments um, how do we know kids are engaged what are some some of those what we call metrics that um, let you know how things are going well, honestly, I you know I depend a lot on the classroom teachers mm -hmm. um, at leadership team. We have conversations. We've developed a design team and an assessment team and a 21st century team here of expert teachers, and so we we get their feedback on what's going on. Um, a lot of it comes from parents who come and say, "Wow, my child! I can't get them to put it down, or they love to go to school, or they're you wow. know they they." They are glad to get back on a Monday morning. You know those kinds of comments. Um, Kelly is in the classrooms a lot. She can do observations and and provide feedback. Um, we've had a lot of get of tours that have come through our school, and one of the comments that we we get is that we walk into the classroom and the kids are very friendly and they speak with us, but they just say hi and come join us. And then they're right back into what they're doing. They're not distracted. So it's very evident the engagement 
when other adults from the outside actually are in our classrooms talking to our students. So I think that's another method. And just recently, we have now gotten the test scores that have shown when Tracy first started this implementation two years ago, we now have test scores that show the difference between one class in fifth grade that had the same instruction, same quality of teacher, versus the BYOT. Wow. And it is markedly different, mm -hmm. markedly higher. And we have to attribute that to the engagement piece and, and Tracy's yeah. good work. So that those are the kinds of things that we're seeing. But we are constantly adjusting and growing just last week during our wonderful snowstorm. Tracy and her team uh, used our um, information management system to do online lessons for kids. So while they're home, they're working online. <laughs> Guess what you were for, guys? Oh, <laughs> <Snow Day. laughs> oh. yeah. So and and so we're looking at that. You know, one of the things with the new evaluation system in the state of Georgia, we have student growth percentile. So we're monitoring now how students grow mm -hmm. in a year's time. And one of the things that we're seeing is that our gifted and high-level kids are not growing as we would like. So how can we open, how can we use our technology to open the classroom walls and bring the world in and challenge them in their interest level? So that's one of the things that, that we're looking at. And, and Kim does a lot of professional learning on inquiry-based learning, um, you know, questioning. As you heard, you know, when Tracy's implementation, the level of her questioning just went up. Mm -hmm. The feedback loop that you were talking about, it's mm -hmm. constant, it's ongoing. And interestingly enough, one of the biggest fears of our parents were that their children would be sitting there looking at a tiny screen all day. Sure. And um, what we have found is the exact opposite. It has promoted such collaboration among the students. You'll walk into a classroom and you'll see four or five kids huddled around one device. And like Tracy was saying, well, one might be looking at their iPad showing what this can do and what this app can do and another one will say look over here see what I can do on my Kindle Fire and, and what this app can do and so they really are working together um, and that's exciting. And they're going into the application piece which is, yeah. is key with the Common Core. Mm -hmm. And I think the, and just to add to that too I think the beauty of them bringing in the different devices is that it causes that need for them to kind of step out of their comfort zone and kind of reach out to each other and learn from each other and we um, are really supportive of the kids in the classroom and honestly though they have become their own technology support team too mm -hmm. because they're all bringing in different devices so you know the students have kind of gotten to the level of comfort that they know they've got to be flexible but they also know they have other friends in their classroom who have the same device that they can go to so they have sort of instructional technology specialists in the room also um, because they're so incredibly um, proficient on the tech in the technology so I mean it's been great we've seen a lot of collaboration we've seen a lot of growth in our special ed students um, like Tracy said it kind of gives them a voice um, and that's really initially where the um, this initiative started in our county we started with the special ed students and then we thought you know what what's good for them might be good for you know a regular mm -hmm. classroom so it kind of has blossomed from there so we've seen a lot of growth in our students and to couple with that we've also spent a lot of time trying to teach them personal skills and, and socialization skills because we want to balance out and want to make sure that they understand mm -hmm. that it's important to be balanced and, and we spend a lot of time we have houses in our building and we spend a lot of um, time talking about the importance of how you you know interact with others and the importance of with how you are socially perceived so because we think that social um, success is, is massively important to where they're going to go well it's um Wow, it's, it's really exciting to hear, again, from people who are doing it in classrooms, working with kids, working with parents every single day. And it's obvious that um, at your school, there's a great deal of trust building. There's some huge feedback loops going on. There's peer learning taking place, and we know that that's also a very valid um, instructional practice to take place. So at this time, um, what we'd like to do is shift to Forest Grove and to Brandon. And if you could uh, uh, share with us how your process is working with regards to, I think you're in a one-to-one -one environment. So Brandon and your team. Yeah, we are in a one-to-one -one environment. We have a, this is our first year of a pilot program funded by our general fund from our school district uh, where all of our students have an iPad and they're able to take them home in the evenings as well. I would say, though, that for us, taking a step back, probably one of the most important things that we did as a staff was we spent 
three years before we made the jump to the one-to-one -one program, really focused on instructional strategies, data teams, all of the things that other high-performing schools have blazed the trail with. And we got really strong and firm about those things before we started talking about bringing more technology into the building. Um, what I tell parents and community groups all the time, because we're presenting quite a bit now, is our core mission has not changed. It, it is the same. It is to increase reading, writing, and, and math skills. And the, the technology just enhances our ability to do that by giving the kids a tool that they can engage with, they're comfortable with, um, that, that they have already probably spent some time with in terms of having a, a device that is Wi-Fi enabled because so many of our kids already are experiencing that. Mm -hmm. So I think that in terms of the process, I would <clears throat> really, really strongly suggest to other schools and, and districts that are thinking about going one-to-one -one is make sure you've done the process of, of ensuring good instructional strategies, collaboration within your teammates, and uh, good, strong professional development practices first before you choose to make a one-to-one move. -one. So the, we, you heard us talking, Brendan, about you know instructional strategies also with Forsyth, and that is such a, um, a good foundation um, to start with with anything that you're going to do in the classroom, whether it be technology or, or anything else, as you've already alluded to. So. Tell us a little bit about how the professional learning then took place. Was it was the PD around the strategy and then how technology can per potentially enable it? How, how, how did the, the PD kind of go forward? Well, really, our professional development model has been to have trainers within the building train the rest of the staff. You know, we, we don't really believe in that. Uh, bring somebody from the outside in and do a one-day training and then leave because, you know, that's not as effective as it could be. So, for the past five years, our focus has really been about developing people in the building that can become trainers of their peers, and the technology is just another example of that. So we didn't necessarily do that instructional work in preparation for going one-to-one. -one. Uh, we were doing that instructional work, and then the uh, an opportunity to go one-to-one -one for our building became a real, a real opportunity for us in the course of that work. So they were not mutually exclusive, but they were not necessarily working in tandem either. So it just made it easier for us to make the jump to one-to-one -to -one and um, maintain that level of rigor and prepare for the Smarter Balanced Assessment and Common Core Standards because of that work that we had already done. So I, I've been to, I've visited a couple of schools that have made the move to one-to-one, -to -one and they're trying to do both, work on the technology and implementation as well as the instructional strategies, and it is overwhelming. It's just so much for people to do. So I think sure. if you can focus on one and then focus on the next piece after that, it makes it a little more a smooth transition and probably more effective for the teachers and for the students. <clears throat> but our model in, in staff development has been to try and create choice, uh, things that people are interested in. A couple of weeks ago, in one of our uh, late start mornings, and we've done this a couple of times, we had six different presentations that staff members could choose to go to, each led by one of their peers. And uh, they could go and, and spend 20 minutes or 30 minutes in that presentation and then move on to another one. So in the course of an hour, teachers were able to see things that their peers were doing in the classroom that was working for them right now, and they could take it back and immediately start to implement it into their classroom. And that's the kind of staff development that we've done for the past several years and seems to be getting us um, good results. And so if they had a subsequent question later about the 30-minute session that they sat in on, uh, somebody was either next door or on the next hall that they could interface with either at lunch or maybe after school or between class breaks, um, but they have that close connection right there in the building. Yeah. It was pretty much like a breakout conference style session slash ed camp kind of an idea. And we also do have a tech support website for staff, so we collect all of the materials and put it online for the staff as well. Mm -hmm. So um, regardless of whether they can access the staff member right next door, they also can jump online and review the material at any time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Nicole and, um, is it Marshall, did I get that right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, being the most important people in the room today, the teachers that are working with kids and teachers that are interfacing, you know, with parents, tell us a little bit about um, how uh, teaching and learning is being further enabled um, in classrooms now that you're in a one-to-one -one kind of environment. I think... Um, I think the first thing I'd talk about is, is kind of going back to the communication 
um, and instant feedback I can get from kids. You know, previous, we've, you know, exit slips and things like that have always been best practice. Um, and in theory, it's a really good idea because, you know, you get all this feedback and you go through it and figure out who needs help. Uh, but the reality with, you know, the iPads is I can get instant feedback right now and it doesn't become a pile of paper on my desk that's something that I need to sort through and try to remember for tomorrow to, you know, who I need to check in with. Um, you know, what I, I use a lot is a Google form and they have to answer one quick question where it's a sentence. And I can look on my iPad and right as they hear that, uh, it pops up and it color codes it. Okay, this kid gets it. This kid is eh, almost there. Um, and, you know, these this population students does not get it. And that can inform my lesson right now rather than me stopping after class and trying to read all these things and change tomorrow's lesson. That can inform me right now about, you know, here's where my kids are at. Here's how my lesson yesterday went. Um, and what do I need to do right now to help these kids get the material that I'm trying to get to them? And the other thing I'd really talk about is, is differentiation. I found to be a lot easier with the one-to-one. -one. Um, a big thing that I do is I haven't, I haven't gone to necessarily like a flip model. Uh, Nicole's done some more of that than I have. But what I've done is used technology to video like a short lesson on, you know, here's the states of matter and here's me talking about it on the board for five minutes. And it's the same lesson I'm going to give in class. Uh, but, you know, obviously a lot of kids don't process that as quickly. Um, some kids I can't teach too fast enough, and then the other half of the kids are trying to keep up with me and take down notes furiously. So I found that if I can post, even if it's a five-minute, the same exact thing I said in class, those kids that are having trouble keeping up, they can go back onto our, uh, our learning management system and look up that video and finish the notes. Or maybe it's time for the test, and they think, oh, geez, you know, I really don't remember this concept. Uh, they can go back and watch the exact lecture 50 times if they need to. Um, so I think those are the two, you know, differentiation and just that instant formative feedback that I can get have been the two most, right. we're talking about aha moments, like the, the kind of the gratification of the technology for me. So, so generally, what does it look like when in classrooms when you feel like kids are really engaged in their, in their learning, whether it be there's technology there or not there, but what does that look like when kids are actively engaged in, in what's taking place in, in, in the learning process? I think that looks different regardless of the, like what classroom you're in. Um, personally, I like Marshall was saying, I run a flipped classroom, so most of the application of what we're learning happens in the classroom, and it definitely does not look like a traditional style classroom where all the kids are silently bent over their desks and you know working independently. We are talking and engaged and collaborating. And it might look a little rowdy to someone coming in, but um, what we're actually accomplishing now versus what we were able to do previous is, you know, talking about the SAMR model. I mean, we're constantly moving and teaching above the line and moving into redefinition category. My students currently are working on, you know, a Genius Hour project. They also are building their own websites. Um, that they're using as a journal as well as an e-portfolio. I mean, these things I never could have done for them or with them prior to the, the tech integration. And I think engagement looks either, you know, totally enamored with what they're doing and focused or, you know, loudly talking with their peers and um, applying the knowledge that, that they're getting. So I think it depends on what classroom you're going into. But I think if you come in and you ask the kids, what are you working on? And they're quick to give you that, you know, instant. Oh, we're doing this, and you know, it's really exciting. Um, I think I think that shows engagement for sure. Right. Yeah. From the I, building, I think, from the building perspective, I would agree that engagement looks different depending upon the lesson or the objective, or the you know, learning outcome. But I've been in Marshall's class where you could hear the crickets in the background of 39 seventh graders all focused on what they were doing. I've been in this classroom where it's been loud and obnoxious, and they're <laughs> running around and doing all the great stuff that they need to do, and it just really depends, but if you're able to, as the observer, kind of cut through and know exactly what the objective is and talk to kids and get that, mm -hmm. that feedback, then you know whether or not the kids are, are actively engaged. You know, I have never been one to, to suggest that an engaged classroom is a quiet, everybody sitting on their hands classroom because mm -hmm. that's not really what we're expecting or wanting kids to do, but right. there are times when it's appropriate and other times when it's appropriate for them to have their hands dirty and really getting in and doing what they need to do. So, so Brandon, tell us a little bit about um, 
how, again, as, as, as we ask for science to do, how you're kind of taking the temperature along the way to see how things are going. You know, it's a formative process of leadership <laughs> um, so that you can make adjustments, course corrections. Um, how do you know for sure that you're being successful with kids being academically successful, kids being engaged, teachers feeling like um, that their, their work is being appreciated? Um, so tell us a little bit about that part. Well, we, we study it in several different ways. So we look at engagement from not only the attendance rates that we have. Um, we have 115 kids right now that have not missed a single day of school. For 850 students, that's a pretty high number. We have run, usually run in the numbers of four to five per year. So to have 115 right now at this point in the year have not missed a day tells us that they're engaged. Um, we survey our students, so they're, we're getting ready to give our students a second survey this week, actually, and then we'll give them a third survey at the end of the year. Um, just around the technology and their feelings around the building and the climate of the building. We've surveyed students, our parents, we've surveyed teachers. Um, we look at our, uh, our academic achievement data to see whether or not we're making improvement. We use some formative assessments along the way to see if we're making improvements. Um, our grades data, um, and then just the general feedback from teachers about what are they seeing and what are the problems they're running into. And, and then beyond that, we have a, a Student Advisory Council for our iPad program, and they give us some good feedback about what they're seeing, what would make it better, and what kinds of things would they like to see us do differently. So we, I think we're trying to gather as much information on those anecdotal kinds of pieces as possible, and then back that up with some of the hard data that, that are included mm -hmm. in that. Sure. So that informal process of surveying uh, gives you further insights as to how to tweak the model um, sure. a little bit on a very regular basis. And uh, as I heard from, from your teachers, um, from Marshall and Nicole, they're trying to do the exact same things in their classroom, is to hear from kids as to how they feel like they're doing and tweak the model as quickly as you possibly can um, for kids. Um, so Brenda, we really like your approach of let's making sure, to, much like Debbie said also, making sure we have good sound instructional practices taking place in our building and teachers feel confident with that and then how can a one-to-one -one potentially further enable um, those things to happen, especially for today's generation of, of learners. So would like to pose one question um, to Forest Grove and to Forsyth also. Um, for, for districts, what we're hearing at COSIN is many, many districts are now saying a digital conversion is not something that well, let me back up. A digital conversion maybe two years ago was something that we would like to do and we'd like to think about in the future and that has shifted, that conversation shifted is that we know we have to do it. It's just a matter of how to do it as best we can and also work within the financial considerations you know that we have. And so this is a very broad question but for, um, we'll start with Debbie if we could. So Debbie, what would be um, one or two recommendations that you would have uh, to a school principal um, who knows that they need to and want to move forward with a, a digital conversion of sign of some kind to further good instructional practices. And so, Debbie, I'll pose it to you and then we'll come back to Brandon. All right. Well, um, the first thing I would say is start small. Find your, find your trailblazers, the one that... The, the ones that want to jump out there and, and try something new and empower them and give them all the support that you can and, 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 to, and to build that culture of step out there and, and just try it and if it doesn't work that's fine at least you stepped out there and tried it because you don't grow until you take those risks. Um, the other thing too that I have tried to share with our staff are the, the PISA reports of where the United States is mm -hmm. globally and, and we're not in a good place. And so it really is up to us to redefine what we do in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. And we know that technology engages students. And we know that, um, the, like we said, the sound instructional practice mm, coupled with that technology is powerful. So I think helping everyone to understand the urgency, not just teachers, but also parents, um, too. Uh, they don't always understand where we are globally. Um, and I do think the other thing that we've done here is we've also uh, 
done a lot of work with collaboration. I heard uh, Forrest Groves talk about this. We've done a lot of work with collaboration among our teachers. What does true collaboration look like? And, and we're not in a profession where um, we can close our doors anymore. We need to share our expertise with each other. We need to model that for students. We've even done that with other schools around our area. Come, let us come and see your classrooms. What are you doing? Come see our classrooms. Let's share the good work. Mm -hmm. so I, those were just a few things that I would do. Very good. And Forrest Go, Brandon? I, I agree with her 100%. I think you've got to start with what we call the coalition of the willing, <clears throat> those people who are willing to go out and try new things and do new things and experiment. But then at the same time, um, as the building principal, I think you have to be developing a very strong vision for what you want the program to look like, and not just in terms of the students, but what are the programs you're going to use? What's the staff development going to look like? What's the parent involvement going to look like? Um, all of those things have to be a part of that process in order to really be able to I think, realize the vision that you have. And so we spent, oh, probably six months just developing that vision for what the what the one-to-one -one model would look like outside of instructional strategies and outside of all of those other things that make up a school. But what, what does that central part of the one-to-one -one or a, of a technology integration plan look like in, in our school? Can I, can I add something to? Absolutely. A personal, a personal aside is, as a leader, and I think as a teacher, all of us at this table, we really had to make a commitment to stay the course because we did, we did weather some rough waters, and um, but we believed in what we were doing, and we knew that it was right for kids, and so we stayed that course, and it was not always easy, and so you. You really have to come to that commitment and be willing to die on that hill, so to speak. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. So. Well, Debbie and Brandon, thank you so very much for taking time to tell us um, in your words um, how stakeholders are uh, progressing uh, through kids being successful and using sound instructional pra uh, uh, strategies and practices and then how technology can potentially further enable that to take place. Today we've heard ahas from both of the districts about what they have learned. We've heard about how teaching and learning is being transformed, even from a teacher who was who was 20 years in and she uh, jumped back in with the challenge there in Forsyth. Uh, we've looked and heard more about the metrics, about how kind of keeping tabs on how well um, that we are doing and what that professional learning looks like. So uh, Kosin thanks you both for taking uh, time to have that conversation with us today. Um, we invite the, uh, uh, the Kosin community uh, and the educational community at large to join us uh, on February the 25th. Uh, next Thursday at 4 p.m. where we'll talk with Vail County School District in Arizona to learn more about their Beyond Textbooks, um, their work around Common Core, uh, Forest Grove and Forsyth, we certainly invite you to join us also, uh, and their influences on a one-to-one. -one. And um, the educational community can join us at the COSIN web, and there is the website um, there on the, on the screen. Again, thank you so very much to both of these districts who are uh, certainly leading the way where kids are going to be uh, academically success, oh, excuse me, successful, going to be ready for the 21st century, and engaged in uh, being lifelike learners. Thanks so very much to everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.